Jess from Prospectus and Core Save. Um, but yeah, I'm going to put you all on mute now. Um, if you can stay on mute for the whole presentation, uh, but use the chat. Let me know if you have any questions, and we'll be opening up the floor uh, at the end. Um, but yes, I firstly just wanted to thank everyone that's been sending through all of the requests and feedback and ideas because I really cannot do it without your help. Uh, so thanks everyone. And speaking of all the requests, I had several to get John on today. Uh, so John, thank you so much for coming along and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, John Ronsky really needs no introduction with this crowd, uh, but to quickly summarize a few of the things that he's achieved. More than 35 years experience in the mining and exploration industry. He is currently a principal of Western Mining Services, a consultancy group that provides uh, strategic level services to the global mineral exploration industry. Um, his targeting has led to the discovery of the West Musgrave nickel copper sulfide province. And he was a consultant to the Gold Road team that discovered the Gruyere Gold Deposit. And in January 2019, he was awarded the Order of Australia Medal for Services to the Mining Industry. Uh, so thank you so much again, John, for joining and really great to have you on. And over to you. Okay, thanks, Jessica. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I'll try and share my screen now. Okay, so <clears throat> what I've uh, been asked to talk about is this this mineral systems concept, this mineral system idea, which, which I think is something that's sort of been evolving in our industry over a couple of decades. But what I have an opportunity to present to you guys in about 30 minutes today is a bit of a, a distillation of what I think are the key, the fundamentally key, key aspects of this way of thinking about mineral deposits. And the reason why I think it's important is I, I think it actually represents the next stage of evolution of our conceptual framework for thinking about mineral deposits. And, you know, sciences go through evolution, uh, particularly natural sciences. They start off in what you might call a taxonomic phase where it's really about identifying things and classifying them. But then as they mature, they try and develop a, a conceptual framework that's process based and, and importantly then becomes predictive. I mean, we saw that with biology, the difference between Linnaeus classifying various species, which was a good start, but then Darwin coming in with, with processes around evolution and then later on uh, processes around uh, DNA. So I think that's where we are with our science. And why it's important is I'm going to argue that it's the essential key if you really want to understand why mineral deposits form and where they form in particular and how to then go about uh, targeting for them. The, this slide, and uh, hopefully it, it's refreshing uh, quickly, Jessica, is that right? The, the slides are, uh, yep, good, okay, great. So th th this slide illustrates the basic challenge of any sort of mineral exploration work, and that is we never have enough data so if anyone tells you that exploration is a big data environment and they can do something with big data, unfortunately, I think they're not right. They're misleading you because we never have enough data. We, we have only a small amount of the data that, 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 that you would require to be definitive. So in a situation where you've got sparse data, the only way you can get from sparse data to where you want to go, which is predictive analysis or targeting, is with some sort of organising framework. So that organising framework is really, really essential. So if we look at the history of our industry, and I'm showing you here on this slide, what I think is clearly been the most successful uh, organising framework in, in the history of our industry, which is, let's call it the porphyry copper model. But it's basically this idea that a whole range of different deposit types associated with, with uh, particular hydrous arc related magmas form a range of different deposits depending on context, depending on uh, uh, paleo depth, et cetera. So this is kind of uh, the version in the Silito paper in 2012, but this is a model that developed from say the, the late 60s and was progressively improved. A very, very successful model because it provided a framework. You could get a little bit of information from your drilling and you could use this model to say something about where you were conceptually in this bigger system. So it had predictive utility. But the question we face, particularly as we go through the 21st century, is how do we expand this type of conceptual framework beyond the deposit scale 
and to other deposit types. And what I'm going to argue is, and this is fundamentally in my mind, what mineral system thinking is about, is it really gets down to the basic physics of what we're trying to do when we make an ore deposit, when we make a metal ore deposit. And it's this basic physics that provides some pretty strong constraints on the parameter space of what is actually possible in, uh, in, in, in making ore deposits. But basically for just about all the metals we're interested in, we have to start off with atoms of the metal, say gold, that are in some sort of relatively diffuse metal source region. And then we have to mobilize them. And pretty much the only way we can do that in any sort of reasonable uh, rate and volume is through advective fluid flow. And those fluids might be water or they might be uh, magma. That is really the two main fluids we look at. And that fluid flow is also an energy flow because we need energy to move those fluids. Then we have to move, concentrate that fluid flux through a narrow rock volume strip out the metals and then of course the fluids continue because unlike petroleum our ore deposits are not the accumulation of fluids they're the accumulation of the products that have been scrubbed from those fluids so that's sort of the basic physics of ore formation and to me that's the heart of sort of mineral system thinking so when we think about mineral deposit formation in this context there's a number of general concepts that I, I just want to summarise here, and then I'm going to talk about in more detail. Firstly, as I sort of showed in that previous diagram, we need to think of ore deposits as the focal points of large scale fluid driven mass flux systems. They're basically where a mass flux system focuses. We also need to understand that when we study an ore body, what we're actually studying is a fossil. It's something that at one stage was a very dynamic active system, but almost always when we're looking at it, it's been uh, fossilized, it's, it's long dead. And why that's important is that true understanding doesn't come from measuring the bones. True understanding comes from conceptualizing them as the active dynamic systems they were with all the sort of four dimensional complexity that that implies. The third point, Energy, you need energy to drive these systems. You've got to take a lot of atoms from a big volume of rock and put them in a small volume of rock. So you have to pay for that in the coin of free energy. That's what the second law of thermodynamics tells us. So more energy is better, but, and this comes to the next point, you've got to do something with that energy flow. You've got to organize that energy flow. So fourth point, to form ore, these systems must self-organize. We, we, we must organize them. and. It turns out that's a really, really important uh, criteria and something that we're only just beginning to understand in the 21st century. I think this was an idea that was sort of largely absent from a lot of 20th century economic geology thinking. And what's really interesting is self-organization is something that only happens in very narrow periods of the general history of our, of our systems, our geological systems. So that's why it's so important in targeting. Our ore deposit models must mass balance. They're all about mass flux and they're all about flows. And many, many models that have been uh, proposed actually fail a pretty basic mass balance test, a common sense mass balance test. And we'll talk about that. And then sort of a final point about um, this concept of mineral systems, there's different lenses that we can look at mineral systems. And the point I want to make here is the lens that you might use to try and understand a mineral system, say from a perspective of an academic researcher, where you're trying to understand the various components and how they come together, is not the same lens that you're going to look at the mineral system through if you're a practical explorer and you're trying to work out the most efficient way to, to, to target uh, exploration discovery. So, here are some guiding philosophies as well that relate to this idea of mineral systems. And the first one I really want to emphasize that all formation is the predictable, this is an important word, predictable consequence of certain particular, although relatively rare parts of the four dimensional evolution of host terrains. In other words, when these, when a particular host terrain like a, a or host a geological setting like a subduction zone environment, is in this particular configuration, it will make an ore deposit. 
Now, why I say that is much of the literature when people have been asked to write uh, you know, when, when, when the historically, uh, you know, senior leaders in our field have been asked to write a paper about why giant ore bodies form, they all pretty much, in, as far as I can tell, have come up with some version of, well, it's the fortuitous combination of all these favourable things. In other words, it's some random stochastic uh, aggregation of these parameters. Now, I don't think that's right at all. I think it's way more predictable than that. And probably the main way I would refute that argument, which I sometimes call the white flag argument, because if it's, if it's true, your, your ability to target is not very high because you're saying it's a, effectively a, a random product. But if that was true, we would not see the fractal spatial distribution of deposits we do see. In fact, what we would see is a Poisson distributions or spatial distributions that were more consistent with a random process. Second point, if we want to understand ore genesis, and spatial prediction, we need to understand the entire systems. Not, but I want to stress this, not every aspect of a system, and we'll talk about ways of screening which aspects of systems are important and which isn't. So it's really important. It's not understanding every little process that could go on in a system, but it is understanding them as integrated holistic systems. And, and ultimately, just about any system that you end up studying, you, you, you end up ha having to, at the highest scale, consider either, you know, global convection, because whether it's orogenic gold or whether it's um, nickel sulfides or whatever, you know, that, that's what things ultimately do get back to. These systems operate across a wide range of scales in both space and time. So the absolutely key cognitive skill that you need to be successful in targeting in mineral exploration is to be able to constitute yourself at these different scales and understand how processes interact across these scales. Emphasize though, not just scales in space, but scales in time. And in, in, in my opinion, much of the sort of misunderstanding that occurs and the, the, the debates and the, the, the long running controversies that occur in economic geology relate to confusion about scales and people not integrating uh, properly across scales. And then the last point, physical processes are the most fundamental in spatial prediction and tend to be generic across ore deposit type. This is really important and it's the fundamental reason why all regional targeting actually works to a certain extent because while there are a lot of chemistries involved in ore formation, if you go back to that diagram I showed you before, which says all those fluids have to converge, the, the physics that govern that organised flux of fluid is the same, irrespective of what the chemistry of that fluid is. So this is really important and, and why we can target. So one of the things I, I'd like you to sort of take away from this, and this is the way I summarise it, is remember that there's lots of chemistries. Every ore deposit will have its complex chemistry. And I'm not saying that that's not necessarily important at certain scales, but there is only one physics. There's only one physics which governs the organized flux of fluids through the lithosphere. The other thing I wanna share with you as context for this is just how perspective has evolved in economic geology. So. If we look at economic geology as a science, which probably really got going in the early 20th century, uh, the journal Economic Geology, for example, uh, published its first edition in 1905. And it's really interesting to go back and look at the type of papers that were published in 1905 in the first edition of uh, Economic Geology. And they're actually largely all specimen descriptions. And it was still then at the level of saying, well, the mineral that copper's in is a mineral called chalcopyrite. The mineral that lead's in is a mineral called galena. It was at that level. And, and what we've actually seen uh, in the last 120 years is an evolution of perspective from ore centric to, we start to recognize that host, certain host rocks show consistent patterns, for example, the porphyry idea. And then we started to recognize that structures were important. And now where I think we need to go and where we're truly honouring the fundamental process dynamics of making ore deposits is what I call the fluid flux centric perspective. And the point about this progression of perspective over a, dec over a century is it's being driven by increasing scales of observation and new data sets have become available to give us that increasing perspective. In my, in my career, the biggest advance was 
the delivery of image process potential field data at regional scales, where all of a sudden we could see structures in magnetics and gravity data over big areas, really change your perspective. And I'm sure that there's, uh, there's many more uh, new data sets coming through, uh, isotopic uh, lithospheric mapping being one that I particularly like at the moment. So let's talk about mineral systems and some points about mineral systems to consider. Mineral systems are big. They really are big if you want to think about the whole system. And here's an example from mid-continent US looking at zinc lead mineralization. And most of the deposits there, they're really those camps of those really little small, almost insignificant, you know, uh, black dots at this scale, but they're all occurring at the margin of these basins with uh, basement, which is the sort of uh, inevitable uh, context, structural context for sedimentary hosted deposits. But those basins show evidence for very significant flow of fluid uh, manifested as dolomitization. So that's a brine flowing through those sediments. And that tells you something about the fluid flow system. Now, I'm not saying that all that fluid flow was re <coughs> resulted in forming those particular deposits. But what I am saying is those deposits are forming in the context of much larger scale physical systems. They're also deep. And this is sort of this iconic image from uh, Graham Heinsen et al from a few years ago of the Olympic Dam system, sometimes referred to as the fingers of God. But this is really saying, and there's no really other way to interpret this, that we're dealing with fluid pathways that are coming from deep in the mantle to make these deposits. So clearly, if we want to be predictive, we do need to understand this deeper aspect of geology. And that sort of takes me to this issue of what I call translithospheric structures or translithospheric faults. And this is targeting 101. If you're ever interested in targeting for mineral deposits, this is where you start. It's the most important and consistent structural pattern in uh, mineral targeting. And it's been recognised since at least the 1930s. I've actually found a reference that uh, you could interpret as, as applying this concept that goes back to 1911. The issue is that, that these important translithospheric structures tend to be cryptic. And there's actually fundamental uh, process reasons for this but they tend to be cryptic in near surface geological mapping and were therefore historically, <coughs> and particularly before we got the, the good uh, lithosphere scale data sets that we have today, only recognized as lineaments. So lineament was kind of a vague concept, some sort of you know, alignment of features. And frankly, for most of the 20th century, the academic community, and in fact, a good portion of the exploration industry were very skeptical about these and they didn't get much attention. Uh, however, these are the master conduits that organise focused crustal fluid flux. They, you know, I think what we understand now, and I, I can't spend too much time on, this in, on them in this talk, but these really are the first order permeability architecture of the lithosphere. I'm not saying they're active at, at every point in time, and in fact, that's where we improve our resolution of targeting by understanding when they are active, but they're certainly very important. So we've got many examples. Uh, this is from the Yulgarn Craton and showing you the association with the significant gold deposits with these fundamental structures. Uh, a, a really uh, well-known example, uh, the uh, Demarco Fault Zone in, in, in northern Chile. And, um, and that's one where we can, uh, Ruben Padilla's work from about 20 years ago, where he, he looks at that, uh, that West Fisher Demarco Fault structure and he, he, he pushes it back in time and he shows that it while obviously it was an important structure in the Eocene Oligocene when these giant deposits were forming, it was actually the margin of a continental rift in the, in the Mesozoic. And it probably was a fundamental boundary going all the way back to, to the Paleozoic. And, and this is in fact, typically what we see with all these structures, they're extremely long lived structures. Now, one of the things to understand about these structures is that they are four dimensional entities. So if we imagine, and this is a simple diagram, but if we imagine that you've got some sort of fundamental basement structure, and then you put new rocks on top, they, they could be volcanic rocks, it could be a uh, sedimentary basin, it could be some sort of uh, overthrust, tectonic overthrust, like we see in the Canadian Cordillera. Because the fundamental break in the basement is always a zone of weakness, it will reactivate and it will propagate up through these new rocks. So 
When it does propagate up though, initially, it will do it in the near surface environment as an anastomosing set of structures. And of course, it's the near surface environment where we form most of our deposits. So unsurprisingly, not many deposits are associated with these strike extents of major shear zones that are obvious from space, because if we're seeing that, we've generally eroded down below the level, the window, the paleo level that's favourable for all deposit formation. But that's also why these things can sometimes be seen as a bit cryptic. A really uh, good example of, of, of these cryptic structures uh, that I like is Northern Nevada, where we've got a, a couple of corridors that were empirically recognised by gold miners a, a long time before uh, you know, ac academic geologists really started to look at them. And uh, they're the Carlin trend and the Battle Mountain Eureka trend. And, and uh, apologies, my labels seem to have slipped a little bit on that, but I think you get what I'm, I'm showing you there. So these are a really important alignments of gold deposits, really important gold deposits. That's one of the world's great gold provinces we're looking at there. But if I show that on a sort of one to a million uh, map of the state of Nevada, there, there is no structure that you can map in that geology. In fact, the geological pattern is totally dominated by this sort of basin and range architecture, which actually post-dates, not by much, but, um, but immediately sort of post-dates the formation of, of uh, these big most of these big deposits. Now, the thing is though, you've got to look at deeper data sets. So this is some work from Grouch et al, where they look at the Bouget gravity and they, they remove the sedimentary basins. And then you see these trends starting to come up on these data sets. Or you could look at seismic tomography, which is a key new data set. The last sort of couple of decades, we started to integrate strongly with our exploration targeting. And this is the 165 kilometer depth slice of the US array, which is a, a very good seismic uh, data set that we have for uh, Western US. And you can see pretty clearly, pretty clear gradients in uh, the mantle lithosphere that relate to these structures. So we've got to think deep when we're thinking about these structures. The other thing is, is about the timing and the multiple stages of activity uh, along these structures. So, you know, if someone looks at a regional structure and they, says to you, they say to you, what's the age of this structure? Uh, you know, they don't understand big structures because that is a naive question because these are structures that have, particularly if we think of them uh, as the entire entity from the basement, that have complex four dimensional histories. But um, I showed you a slide of the, uh, this sort of Damaico uh, fault zone uh, corridor uh, earlier in this talk. And here's a, a, a cross section from Constantine Mapadopoulos of Conego, uh, a structural interpretation across this position where, the, where there's the Esperanza copper porphyry deposit. And I guess why I like this is I look at this and just in this zone of about a kilometer wide, Along that structure, there are four different phases of movement along the same structural zone. Important to understand that this is the rule, not the exception for these structures, multiple uh, complex histories. Okay, you might recall before, I said that we need to remember that all systems are fossils, right? And think of the analogy of a dinosaur fossil skeleton, in this case, a Tyrannosaurus rex. So you can go to a, a museum and you can look at that skeleton and you can measure it and say things about how tall it was, etc. But the really interesting question is how fast did it run? So if those of you who remember Jurassic Park, which is quite an old movie now, but you remember the Tyrannosaurus rex when it got on the loose, it actually chased down one of those Ford explorers. And that, of course, was highly controversial in the paleontological community because some people said that a Tyrannosaurus rex couldn't run at 30 or 40 kilometres an hour. The best it could do was shuffle along because otherwise it would fall and break its rib cage. Well, I'm no expert. I don't know what the answer to that question is, but that's an example of a sort of dynamic question that we, in that case, paleontologists are interested in for dinosaurs and we as economic geologists are interested in when it comes to ore deposits. It's not just measuring the bones, but it's asking the question, how fast did they run? And I just sort of illustrate with this slide and most of the three examples, nickel sulphide deposits, because 
it's often clearer in orthomagmatic deposits the, and, and one Olympic dam. But the, why I'm showing you these four pictures is because I want to say something about anomalous energy being involved in these systems. So I'll start with Sudbury in the bottom left hand corner. Now, as I'm sure all of you know, Sudbury is one of the world's two giant nickel copper PGE deposits and we'll come to the other one in a second. But you probably also know that it's an impact crater or it's, a, it's uh, interpreted to be an asteroid, uh, astroblem an impact feature. But perhaps what's less well known is it's actually the second largest one of these that we actually see in the terrestrial record. The only bigger one being the Vredefort Dome. And of ones where you actually preserve the melt sheet, in other words, you actually haven't eroded away most of the, uh, the impact structure, it's actually the largest. So can you imagine, so it dwarfs the, the, uh, the feature that um, wiped out the dinosaurs, for example. So pretty bad day on earth, the day the Sudbury nickel deposit formed. So that tells you something about, you know, the energetics involved. You can go and look at Norilsk, its companion equal giant nickel copper PGE deposit in Siberia. And that's associated with the Siberian traps. And it's associated with the Permo-Triassic transition. Now, I think most of you probably know that that is the greatest mass extinction that we see in the Phanerozoic geological record. Multicellular life came pretty close to being wiped out. It, it was a very bad time to be on Earth as well. And that extinction is, by most people, related to the uh, outpouring of these kilometres thick sequences of basalt in the Siberian traps, which are, of course probably were much bigger than the bits that are, are, are still preserved today. So once again, you know, giant nickel deposits, you don't want to be around when they're forming. If we look on the top right hand corner, what that diagram is showing is some cross sections through a number of Kamadiite nickel uh, channels, uh, key and Kamadiite nickel channels. And the biggest one is Perseverance. It's got the greatest amount of mineralization, but apart from being the thickest channel, because we can directly infer the temperature of these magnesium magmas because from the Forsterite content of uh, coexisting cumulus olivine, what we actually know is that that's the hottest magma that has ever, to our knowledge, flown on the surface or near the surface of the earth. So not only is it an incredibly thick uh, pile of these cumulates, these uh, olivine accumulates, it's forming from extremely hot magma. Okay, and then a non-nickel example, Olympic Dam. And look at the scale bar there in the corner, sort of one kilometer scale bar. The, the, the thing I wanna point out is this boundary here. So within this boundary, you're basically dealing with fractured granite, fractured granite breaches. And of course, within this boundary, the rock is totally brecciated. Now, when you think of the volume of brecciated rock involved there, try and do the thought experiment and think about how many atom bombs would you need to blow up in that rock to fracture it to that same level? And I think you're gonna come up with a big number. So vast amounts of energy involved in forming giant deposits. And that's as the second law of thermodynamics would predict. And as our very first slide, which says, you know, we've got to take atoms of metal from a big volume and put it in a small volume, and we can only do that by driving it with energy, would tell us is, is right. But energy itself is not enough. We've got to organise. We've got to organise that energy. And when we talk about mineral deposits, energy flux and fluid flux are basically synonyms. That's how we move energy around. Uh, in, in ore deposits with, with, with the movement of fluids. Now, Per back many years ago, uh, spoke about or came up with the idea of self-organized critical systems in nature. And the basic idea and, and the Gutenberg-Richter relationship for earthquakes was the classic example. And the basic idea of a self-organized critical system in a sense of per back is that you add energy slowly to a system but it encounters some sort of barrier to the energy flow. And what happens is you, you get a gradient that increases. And at some point, the barrier fails. And then the energy is released in an avalanche at that point of failure. 
So this particular cartoon I've shown here sort of um, models this as a the threshold barrier as some sort of maybe anti-formal sort of impermeable zone. It doesn't have to be, but actually in a lot of cases it, it actually is, in, particularly in, uh, in, in deposits forming in, in sort of mesothermal environments. Uh, but the, the point is, if you imagine that you're adding fluid relatively slowly along some major shear zone or so on, and you, you have this particular barrier, what's actually going to happen is you're going to form some sort of fluid reservoir and it's going to build up. But at some point, that barrier will fail. And this is the magic from the point of view of making ore deposits, because where will it fail? It will fail at the weakest point. And the point about that is the weakest point is a point. So it's one spot where it fails and then everything will gush up that weakest point. So right there, that's your mechanism. It, it, it's like your gearbox of forming ore deposits from taking a broad diffuse flow and converting it into a focus flow. Now, the model, the analogy I like for thinking about ore deposits and it is to think about lightning, right? So how does lightning work? Well, as a sort of a, a person who's not an expert on lightning, as far as I understand it, you've got a cloud layer and electric charges accumulate relatively slowly in the cloud layer. Now, you get it, so you get a voltage, you get a gradient between the cloud and the ground but current doesn't uniformly flow from the cloud to the ground. And why is that? Well, it's because air is pretty resistive, right? You know, uh, current does not flow very easily through, through air. So, but at some point that gradient is so steep, it actually overcomes that barrier and we get lightning very, very rapidly breaching that barrier or, or electricity very, very rapidly breaching that barrier. And that's what a lightning bolt is. And while we, we always say, well, lightning doesn't ever strike twice in the same place. We know that that's not actually true. And if you had a tall metal pole somewhere in that system, it would be getting struck quite a few times with lightning. So keep that in mind. Now, if you turn that model upside down, I'm gonna argue that this is more or less what an ore forming system looks like is that you, you're accumulating ore fluids and this is some sort of reservoir. And at some point that accumulation of fluids causes a failure and a transient discharge. So in the same way, we, we take all this static electricity in the cloud and we make a concentrated flux of electrons, which is lightning. We do the same thing uh, with ore fluids and of course, I referenced lightning rods before, right? So what we've got to think about is geological lightning rods, because what would be the equivalent? Well, pipes of brittle rock are, are a very good example. Now, in, you know, in, in real life systems are probably more complex and we probably have, we can have nested versions of this. But to me, this is a kind of a neat way of thinking about the fundamentals of why we have to organize, we have to organize fluid flow. And this is, I think, a really central concept that will relate to how we then refine our targeting ideas from not just simply looking at structural architecture, but how we can prioritise that even further. I do want to make a point about timescales, and I talked about the need to integrate across timescales. And that some of the misconceptions in our science really come from people not, not really understanding that. And in my opinion, a really big one comes from structural targeting, where people don't really understand that the sort of timescales involved in, in doing something like folding these rocks or general background strain of the rock mass is many orders of magnitude different from the timescale associated with doing something like this, which is in placing a gold bearing vein, which is something I'm quite interested in. They're big differences in timescale. So you can't just say, well, we fold this and we, we, we make some dilatant space and this vein forms in there. That, you know, that's just ridiculous. So talking about scale and relating it to this model that, that we were speaking about before for self-organisation, it actually has a pretty important generic implication. And that is that the sort of concepts that we want to use to target the fluid reservoir and I believe that fluid reservoirs are the geological 
entity or the geological meaning that defines a camp, a cluster of deposits, those concepts are going to be different from the concepts that actually localise a deposit. Because down in here, in forming the reservoir, what we want is, is these actively deforming basement structures and a relatively slow flux that somehow gets trapped in some sort of reservoir. But to make a deposit, we want that reservoir to fail and have these rapid pathways to the surface. So in understanding where the camp is, we want to understand the architecture and that architecture actually needs to be moving because you know, if you don't have strain, you don't have permeability throughout most of the, uh, the, the Earth's crust. So, you know, there is a, an opportunity to predict that based on, on far field strain considerations. But once you fail, once this reservoir fails, remember this is a lightning bolt now, this is a lightning bolt equivalent. The key control is how easy is it for that fluid to crack its way through to the surface. And the far field tectonic stress is totally irrelevant. It's really, that's, it's on a completely different time scale. And I think that's really important to understand. So there's a couple of, um, ways we can take these mineral system ideas and, and develop some, uh, uh, so, some frameworks for understanding them. Uh, and th th there's, there's two that, that, that we like, and that is, I'll probably just go straight to them. The first framework is understanding ore genesis as the focus of a scale hierarchical uh, mass concentrative system. And the idea is that yeah, this is just an abstract model for thinking about this system, but you have a primary fluid source region, you have a fluid delivery pathway, some sort of fluid reservoir, and the fluid reservoir exists because you have a, a, a fluid flow barrier and that fails and you have a focused fluid exit conduit. So that's the organisation we're talking about. And um, interesting thing about that is you can relate that to our scales observation. So. The, the fluid delivery pathway and the source region really define the regional scale. The fluid reservoir defines the camp scale and the deposit scale is the fluid sink. And I think I just probably emphasize a little bit this idea about um, the camp scale be, because camp, the idea of a camp and by camp, I mean a cluster of broadly uh, similar deposits at the same time is an empirical concept we've had for a while, but I don't think it's really in the past actually had a geological meaning. But if we understand a camp as a series of deposits that are all focused from and derived from the same underlying fluid reservoir, I think we can under start to understand it as a geological entity. I think this actually works quite well, for example, in porphyry situations where we've got the geophysical data to actually image uh, you know, the underlying uh, intrusions of reservoirs. But there's another complementary framework for looking at mineral systems, which I think is really quite important for prediction. And that is to say that ore genesis is the conjunction of three independent sets of favorable conditions. And I really want to stress independent because most times people will show you a model for all the things that have to happen. Maybe it's in their uh, mineral prospectivity map or whatever, all the things that have to come together to make a deposit. Most times there's strong degrees of dependency between these various components. But what we're trying to pull out here in this model is the three aspects that are completely independent of each other. So one is fertility, and that is the fundamental ability of the system to host metal. So you know, whether it's tapping a particular source region in a sedimentary basin, whether you've got access to the right brines and the right the, the right metal source, whatever. That will be a characteristic of the particular um, ore system that we're looking at, whereas the other two will be generic. So lithosphere scale structure, we've talked about that a lot. We need the right sort of architecture. And then this one, favorable transient geodynamics. And to me, probably the most interesting thing that, that, that we've really learned about economic geology in this century has been the fact that, and this has come from ever better geochronology, but the fact that when we look at the timing of ore deposits, they're occurring in very narrow time intervals within much broader periods of time during which the particular origin, uh, subduction zone, basin, whatever is evolving. Really important and, and 
these can prevail over very large distances and include multiple different types of deposits. I don't have time to show you examples of that today, but it is really, it, it is a, a, a really interesting aspect and I am going to come to that in a bit more. So just to summarize these two frameworks, I think each of these two frameworks requires us to focus on a different critical aspect of the mineral system that we need to understand to be predictive. So framework one focuses our thinking on the hierarchical scale of processes that form a giant ore system and therefore the critical observations we need to make at each scale, i.e. what is the barrier? What is the barrier that's producing our fluid reservoir in this particular system? Framework two focuses our thinking on those critical factors that must come together in four dimensions in time and space to form a, a giant ore system. And, and they're both different lenses, complementary lenses of looking at the same problem. I do want to talk a bit more about this idea, which I think is, is really interesting. And that is the importance of transient favorable geodynamics. And as I said, we, we, as we get better data, particularly high resolution geochronology, we better understand patterns of global geodynamics. We see that major ore forming events occur in narrow time intervals often over broad areas. So a good example is, you know, Bendigo, Ballarat and Stahl and the Cadia deposits, which are, you know, over a thousand kilometres apart, forming at exactly geologically the identical time within the, uh, within the Lachlan origin. So it's pretty clear that these critical time horizons must reflect unusual regional scale geodynamic settings that are favourable for mineralisation. It's also pretty clear it must be fundamentally about the physics because it seems to relate to quite different ore deposit types. And also clear that these favorable settings must be transient, lasting for only short periods of geological time. So here's some example. Uh, the Northern Nevada Miocene uh, Bonanza Gold Province. And this is associated with the Yellowstone hotspot. But the interesting thing is the Yellowstone hotspot first impacts here at about 16, 17 MA and bang, we get gold deposits forming. And then it does its thing and it migrates or North America migrates over it. No more ore deposits. It's that initial, that initial impact that, that, that's so important. Uh, here's a good example from Tampacan in the Philippines. Uh, it, and it's a recent example. It's a little bit of a complex diagram, but, but basically what Bruce Rolak did here was say, well, you've got subduction, you've basically got convergence between the Philippine, Philippine Sea Plate and the Sunder Block, and that's been accommodated on a number of different subduction zones, which we can actually understand pretty well. And there's actually a subduction zone reversal that happens. And all the movement that could not be, all the shortening that could not be accommodated on those subduction zones represents compression. And when you do that, you see a very, very interesting thing and that the mineralization correlates exactly with that pulse of compression. And you can see that there's maybe a sort of a, a million year period. And this is, with, this is when the life of one stratovolcano, right? So this eight million year period, you, the, 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 the Tampacan stratovolcano has got magmatism for that entire eight million years, all deposits forming here. And it forms when you have this transient period of compression. And, and many of you are probably aware of, of Bob Laux's work that, that builds on those sort of observations, but transient favorable period. So if we try and put all these things together and, and, and ask ourselves the question, how can it be that this is a, a generic factor that goes across different ore deposits? This is my hypothesis for it. And that's to say that to make an ore deposit, what you fundamentally need is organization of the fluid. And we talked about the need for organization before. So I think what happens is that in most geological settings, there are many pathways for the, when you've got active extension going on in particular, there are many pathways for the fluid to escape, whether it's a magma or whether it's a, an ore fluid. But if we're gonna make an ore body, we've actually got to make it hard for the fluid. Why? Because when we make it hard for the fluid, the fluid has to organize itself. The fluid will still escape because you can't build fluid pressure in the crust indefinitely, but it will escape through these very localized weaknesses and points of failure. So I think this is a concept that, that relates sort of observations at the deposit scale, our, our lightning analogy, 
to these regional concepts about transient geodynamics. And so fundamentally what I'm saying is that uh, ore forming potential is where you intersect in four dimensions, active fluid production with a non-dilational geodynamic setting, a tight geodynamic setting. And that could be just because it's the very first increment of extension or the very first impact of a plume or because, because you've just clamped it tight with a local compressive anomaly. And these things are fundamentally unstable. They can't last for very long. They're gonna be these short periods of time. And it's these environments that have ore forming potential. So they're rare, but actually they're also predictable. So pretty much any time you take a subduction zone and you hit it with the compressive anomaly that causes high pressure fractionation of those magmas, you will generate mineralization and probably the, the greater the anomaly, the greater the mineralization. So these things are, are predictive. And here's a modern model that I really like. And it's looking at central Italy. And one of the things about central Italy today is there's a pretty significant flux of CO2 from the mantle. And what's interesting is there's two different modes by which that CO2 flux manifests. So in the sort of um, western part of central Italy, what we see is the CO2 flux coming through to the surface in a pretty dispersed way as a whole series of mud volcanoes, etc. And you can see that diagram, which is basically mapping the, the flux of CO2 with the hotter colours obviously being higher CO2 flux. But the other thing I'm showing you on that diagram are seismic epicentres. And I particularly draw your attention to this cluster of epicenters here, which very interestingly sits right at the gradient of that area of CO2 flux. So what are we looking at there? Well, we're actually looking at two geodynamic environments. So on the western side of the peninsula, we're dealing with the Tyridian Sea, which is a back arc, it's extensional, lots of opportunity for fluid to flow up through the mantle. In the eastern part, we're dealing with the Apennine Mountains. It's, it's a fold belt, it's a mountain belt, and what we actually know is happening, because there's some deep holes at um, Donato and Stefano, they're four or five kilometre deep holes, which are drilled into deep reservoirs, and they've shown that those deep reservoirs are full of overpressured CO2. And what's that CO2 doing? It's building up these reservoirs and it's failing, and it's failing in these fluid exit conduits, not that different to ore bodies. And of course, when it's doing it, it's creating quite nasty earthquakes. And some of you may be aware that uh, you know, a few years ago, some Italian geologists got chucked in jail because uh, they were seen not to have uh, properly warned people about those earthquakes. Well, these are the ones. But the way I would summarise this is like this. Extensional zone, diffuse fluid flow, compressional belt, organised fluid flow. And I think it's a really central concept because this gets back to this idea of transient geodynamics and, and how it generates these transient environments that are favourable for ore formation. Um, a couple of other points. Uh, viable ore deposit models must balance. Um, so one of the big breakthroughs that occurred in, um, I guess, structural geology, particularly applied to the petroleum industry going back to the 70s and 80s, was the realisation that there's all sorts of ways you could uh, interpret a section, but ultimately you had to start off with some sort of layered basement and you had to honour the fact that you couldn't create or lose mass in that system. And that's a real discipline that significantly improved the quality of those interpretations. Well, in the same way, a viable ore deposit model must ba mass balance. So for example, if you've got a model that invokes mixing between some uh, fluid conduit deep in the brittle ductile zone with some surrounding ambient fluid, can you actually make that happen in a mass balance sense? I don't think you can. Or Basically, pretty much any sort of, and there's a lot of them, any sort of ore deposit model that says, I take my ore fluid and I react it with my host rock, and that reaction is the key process, basically doesn't really pass the mass balance test. Because, for example, if you look at a typical orogenic gold deposit, you need, and you can constrain this with things like silica solubility and all sorts of other things, you, you need roughly two orders of magnitude more fluid than what you have host rock. So in the same way, putting you know, one grain of sugar into a, a, a cup of water is not gonna change its taste. Putting one two hundredth 
mass of rock into a mass of fluid is not going to change that fluid very much. So, you know, basically it means that fluid, all bodies have to form either through fluid mixing or unmixing, I think is where, is where that, that takes you. I talked before about the fact that while there are a lot of processes, not all processes are important. And I think uh, one of the big, uh, if you like, um, failings, I suppose, of a lot of efforts in, in, in the last couple of decades for people to try and produce sophisticated computer models of processes is they've assumed that every single process is important and it's not the case. Some, some processes are vastly more important at any scale than, than other processes. And this is a, a framework that I really like that uh, Steve Barnes from CSIRO and Jesse Robinson produced. And what they do there is they, they, they basically throw all the, and this is of course looking at nickel sulfides, but you could apply this methodology for anything. And they, they throw onto the graph all the processes that you could imagine in terms of where they are in, in, in time and space, uh, you know, length scale and, and, and length scale, time scale, space. And the key point is it's actually the fastest process that any length scale that dominates. And not every process is important. It'll, there'll be one process which will overwhelmingly be more important. So this is an important way to think about uh, mineral systems. I talked about the different lenses for thinking about mineral systems. So this is the classic uh, model from Wyborn uh, 94 to, to think about uh, mineral systems. And it's a, it's a good way to think about them if what you're most interested in is all the components that go to make up a mineral system. However, it's not necessarily useful for uh, predictive targeting. And it's important to understand, uh, you know, I, I say this because I think some people will go with a system like that and then they'll try and make that into uh, the, the, the targeting model, but that's not necessarily the right way to do it. Um, if we look at the predictive lens, and here I'm using uh, the model I showed you before with, with a bit of a modification. So we want fertility, we want favorable whole lithospheric architecture, we want favorable transient geodynamics, all completely independent variables. So when they do intersect in space and time, that means a lot. And then of course, we have to exhume and preserve uh, the, the deposit as well. And, and that's something that we can also predict uh, based on, on regional geology. So just to draw all that together, going back to my, my Carlin example, I like this because I think this actually shows all three of those components. Fertility, well, I believe that fertility in gold systems has got a lot to do with uh, metasomatism of the upper mantle, particularly older mantle, I think seems to often be more fertile. And what we see in Carlin is this old Grouse Creek block and it probably extends under the Carlin trend and probably has a lot to do with, uh, you know, why that trend is where it is. And then we've got architecture, lithospheric architecture, the Carlin trend, uh, the Battle Mountain Eureka trend. So that's, that's this part of it. And then finally, the transient geodynamics. So what Carlin deposits are uh, associated with is a tectonic switch. So the Laramide uh, compression, the Laramide mountain, it's been compressional for tens of millions of years, and then it switches to extension, it kind of unzips. And at the point of unzipping is exactly where we find the Carlin deposit. So it's where that unzipped arc intersects that architecture. And I, so I think that's where all the three uh, components come together. So really, uh, that's, that's the end of my talk, and I guess I'd be happy to take questions or whatever, Jessica. Holy moly. That was awesome. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> yep. There's um, some coming through on the chat now. So that was great. You've had lots of brilliant talks, fantastic. Lots of thanks. So thank you again. Um, will the advent of AI and ML, which are basically based on finding patterns and relationships using big data, make the application of mineral systems framework per se redundant, at least in terms of targeting and in relatively data rich regions and camps. I'm thinking from a junior perspective. Yeah, no, short, short, short answer is no. And I say that based on about 10 years of empirical experience of people, people trying to do it. So none of this is new and some very, very smart, well-funded groups, groups that have spent hundreds of millions of dollars on it, uh, have tried to do it. And at this stage, they've totally, they've all totally failed. And I think the reason why they've totally failed is they've missed, it gets back to that very first slide uh, 
that I put up there. And that's a misconception that the mineral exploration environment is a big data environment. That is a fundamental misconception. The, the mineral ex exploration environment is a scarce data environment. Now, whether something is a big data environment is not measured by the terabytes that, that your, your data um, sets might represent. It's measured by how well the data sets that you have represent the problem of interest. And let me just draw an analogy between uh, two things outside geology. So, or, or one of them is kind of geology and that's weather prediction and earthquake prediction, right? Now, both of these are the, your classic chaotic nonlinear systems. But if we look at progress over the last 40 or 50 years, we've made major progress in weather prediction, right? It's, it's now reliable. We've made zero progress in earthquake prediction. What's the fundamental reason? I think the fundamental reason is we can image, you know, we, we can see the weather system. We can run lots of computer models. We can do this because we can parameterize it. We can, we can uh, measure it. But you look at earthquakes, right? You have a big earthquake in Christchurch and everyone goes, oh geez, there was a, a fault there that we didn't even know about. It wasn't even in our model. So how are you gonna predict something when you haven't even observed the inputs? So I, I think that there is a, a strategic role, a, a, a focused targeted role for uh, big data technologies at various components of the mineral exploration process. But because, because we're only just beginning to, to like if, if we had a high resolution, one kilometer grid model of the entire lithosphere, uh, then, then, then it might work. But be, because, because we're only just starting to scratch the surface, you know, you, you could argue it's a bit like saying, um, if we weren't able to image the human body, if we didn't have x-rays and all we could do was look on the outer side of the human body and look at the skin, would getting more and more sophisticated ways of looking at the human skin really tell us whether someone was going to have a heart attack or not? And I think the answer is no. Um, are there any good geological examples of a failed fluid reservoir camp scale with a nearby deposit? A, a failed fluid reservoir? Yeah. Does that, does, do, do you mean a, a fluid reservoir that, um, that has the, like the, the that failed and, and produced a, a, a fluid exit pipe. Is that, is that what we're saying? Uh, David, did you want to jump off mute? If you can. Uh, yes, John, uh, you use the example, regional scale, camp scale and deposit scale that required a, uh, a fracturing or, or break of that fluid reservoir. So I was looking yep, for, yep. Uh, there are good, some good geological analogues that we could see the actual reservoir. And oh, look, I think the simplest example comes from a lot of porphyry systems and where, I mean, first of all, if you look at the famous Yerrington one where, uh, you, you know, it, it, it later, later extensional tectonics puts it on its side and uh, you, you can trace those porphyries are traced back into a sort of a, a, a batholith that's probably about, you know, four or five kilometers uh, deeper than the ore system in, in, in a paleo uh, depth sense. Uh, if you look at some of the Chilean systems that I've had the fortune to work on that have got, you know, really good proprietary gravity data, you, you can see, you can image quite clearly some sort of batholithic reservoir. Now, as, as a technical point, I will say that those are just still staging chambers and, and they're not necessarily where the ore, ore fluids actually originally form, which is you know, a lot of work says is probably at the Moho, but they're clearly the, the proximal reservoirs that fail to make our, our porphyry systems. So, uh, so I think they're some of the more, the, the more robust examples. You know, what we see, for example, in orogenic gold deposits is there's inevitably a very strong association with antiformal combinations at, at, at multiple scales. And uh, some people may remember the work that the PMDCRC did in the gold fields, looking at deep seismic and it found these you know, the, these nested sort of architecture. So I think that, you know, that would be a, a, a pretty good example. Thanks, John. 
Um, there's one comes through. The latest Smedge talk was by Greg Hall presenting work by Vic Wall on the wits. Invoked a large hydrothermal system rather than the placer model. Thoughts? Uh, I like the placer model. I, 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 you know, the WITS looks completely different to any other gold deposit you're ever going to see. Uh, I think Quentin Henning, for those who are familiar with his model, I think he's basically got it right. Um, you, you know, it's funny when I went underground at, at the Vits once and I'm, I'm talking to the geologists and they work for a company that at that stage liked the epithermal model and, and he asked them, well, which model did you like? And they said, oh, well, you know, the, sorry, the epigenetic model. He said, we, they said, we tell our bosses it's the epigenetic model, but for our day to day mind geology, we use the syngenetic model because that's the one that works. So, yeah, I, I'm uh, definitely a, uh, a syngeneticist for the Wits. It, it doesn't, there, there is no way that any other gold deposit in the world has that sort of continuity. I mean, you know, during the heyday of the bits, they were prepared to sink uh, several kilometre deep shafts on the basis of half a dozen drill holes. No one's going to do that in any other type of uh, gold deposit in the world. Right. Um, so lots of more Thank yous and bravos and thought provoking thank yous. Um, Geoscience Australia and the State and NT Geological Survey spend a lot of effort in collecting pre-competitive data. It is great to see these data being used to make discoveries, Lake Wells, Julma, Gruyere, to name a few. What data sets do you think GA and the Ge Geological Survey should focus on? You mentioned isotope mapping, yep. what about others? Yeah, okay, great question. First of all, let me say that I don't think there's ever a significant ore deposit that's ever been found in Australia in the last 50 years that wasn't founded on government pre-competitive data. You know, it, 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 we sometimes maybe take it for granted, but it's a fantastic resource that we have in this country and uh, it, it, it underpins uh, everything, pretty much every significant success. That's my first point. Second point is, I think GA are doing lots of great stuff. They're doing the, the conventional stuff, you know, higher resolution gravity. Uh, you know, to me, uh, as, as a, from a pragmatic targeting point of view, you know, gravity is one of the best, I mean, we, and I say this because we've actually got a lot of magnetics now for, for, for the country. And, uh, and I, I think there's, there, there's limited potential to improve that. But, but gravity is really good because that tells you a lot about these fundamental structures. It actually sees deep. And, and you should be getting from me now that it's important to see deep. But beyond that, the data sets that are really exciting me are magnetotellurics and, and passive seismic. And, and the, you know, some of this uh, OSLAM, OSARAY type, uh, type data sets, uh, you know, I think they're going to be transformational. And there's going to, I mean, we're already seeing really exciting stuff coming out of the Northern Territory and, and, and some of the features, you know, we're really starting to image in, in relatively high resolution data sets, things that people like myself have been, you know, drawing as lines lines on maps and, and probably not everyone would believe it, but now we're starting to get, we're, we're really imaging that. And uh, what's gonna happen is, is we're gonna get, that resolution is gonna improve and there's gonna be a point at which it's gonna be a breakthrough. And I'll, I'll just remind everyone, right, that the greatest advances in the science of geology have always come about when you've had a new data set that's helped you look at the earth. You know, the mapping of the ocean floor that really came out of World War II submarine warfare, there was a straight line between that and plate tectonic theory because all of a sudden it changed what was just sort of blank blue areas on a map to, to a real world with, 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 with real features, mountains, trenches, etc. Now, you know, when we start to image the crust and the lithosphere as we're doing, we are actually going to, there's going to be a point where that's going to be revolutionary. That's going to be break, that's going to be a breakthrough. But I really put a plug in for the isotopic mapping, you know, which was uh, really developed by a couple of GA guys, you know, in the early parts of this century, uh, Kevin Cassidy and Dave Champion, because what that starts to do is put some of these observations into a time context as well as a spatial context. Because of course, you know, one of the problems with geophysical data is you're only ever imaging what it is now. And what isotopic data does is it enables you to say something about what it might've been you know, back in the Archean or the Neo-Archean or the Mesoarchean. So 
it, like everything, it's, it's, it's going to be the integration of these data sets. But I really love the work that GA are doing in, in collecting these things. And, um, you, you know, and that, that, that work has a short term thing. So one of my companies, we picked up a lot of ground in, in the Northern Territory, but it also has a fundamental contribution to our science and our understanding. Excellent. Um, there, thank you for acknowledging the impact of government geological surveys. Um, how do you apply these ideas, especially in greenfield areas where targets are concealed and data is incomplete? Well, I suppose my whole talk is about how to operate in areas that are concealed and where data is incomplete. And it, it, that's that whole idea that, you know, you've got scarce data and you need some sort of conceptual framework to organise that data. But um, very fundamentally, uh, I spoke about the fact that targeting 101 is understanding your transletospheric faults and inferring those. Now, you, with poor data, you're not going to get it right all the time. But, 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 you know, in somewhere like Australia with regional scale data sets, you're, you're going to be able to have a first crack at it. Um, I haven't seen anything come through up oh. in your view. What are the chances of finding a T1 base metal deposit in the next five years? I think very good. And I think that because we're seeing a real renaissance in greenfields exploration, as I'm sure most of you are aware, if you look at the last two or three years, we've probably found more new deposits in Australia than the last 20 in a, in a greenfields environment in, in the gold and, and, and base metal space. And, and there's a you know there's a lot of exciting things uh, uh, emerging. Uh, you know I think once again referencing exploring for the future. I think that's opened up a massive search space for said hosted copper and sort of base metal deposits in general in the Northern Territory. So, uh, but I think importantly I think the government sort of led a bit on this. But you actually need the industry then to invest. And at the moment the climate is more favourable for greenfields investment than it's been uh, for a very long time, for at least a decade. So I'm quite optimistic. Excellent. Um, so on that, I'll do a super quick plug in a couple of weeks. Marina is on to talk about the exploring for the future. So I'll just quickly throw that in while you've mentioned it. Um, yes, hello. I'm so excited to have you on. Hello, Thank Randy. you. <laughs> Um, good comment on the use of AMT and passive seismics. Any thoughts on tips for exploring undercover where conventional means, example, soil geochem may not be as effective? Well, I think um, one of the things that, that we need to look at, and I know is also included in exploring for the future is hydrogeochemistry and, uh, and, and maybe getting a bit better at, at understanding that. Uh, the level of expertise we have in this country on that is still quite low. Uh, I think there's a lot of variables, but um, you know there there are quite a like the exploring for the future. Once again, you know it's in an area of the Aramanga Basin. A lot of it. It's an area of cattle stations. Um, yeah, there are a lot of water bores. So I think I think that's something that's worth putting putting more more effort into. Excellent. Did anyone else have questions? You're welcome to jump off mute um, as well if you want any comments. Ken? John, absolutely brilliant talk. I really like your upside down lightning analogy. <laughs> Historically, analogy has been very important in the way that we've tried to understand natural systems. And I'm sort of taken back. My um, Currently, my great hero is Humboldt. And uh, he did a lot with analogy. And in fact, if you look at it, it's quite interesting. There's a pattern, a cyclic pattern of through history, um, going right back you know, to the 19th century and probably beyond, of how we, you see uh, in some periods, there's a big picture approach or view, and then more local views. So people like Humboldt mm. and people in the early part of the 19th century did have a big picture view of the earth, probably the first time they were able to do that by the ability to travel widely. And he came up with a concept of sort of ore deposits or ore deposits being related to tectonic processes and mountain chain. Yeah. 
Okay, just by. Okay, real, so when was that? When was that? What? Uh, well, he did. He, he did his famous travels in the um, early 1800s, about 1800 and Okay. Get a big trip to South America. Okay. And yeah, that's um, what I thought. Yeah. And he, uh, following on from his work, people like um, well Roderick Murchison, and then later on in Australia W. B. Clark, actually predicted the occurrence of payable gold in Australia by analogy with the Ural Mountain region. And they had an idea mm, back then yeah. that there was some sort of meridional control. So there were meridians on the planet that would be favorable for, um, you know, gold deposits in this particular case, but probably also other mineralization. So that was a very primitive first step in thinking about big scale planetary processes. And then it all sort of went in the, I guess, as you pointed out in the very early part of the 20th century when we got better equipment for looking, identifying minerals and looking in a detailed scale, everyone started then zooming in on, you know, the importance of- Became minerals, quite reductionist, didn't it? Yeah. All that sort of thing. And now we're, we're back into the big picture view, again, because we've got these new uh, techniques that we can, again, look at the planet in a holistic way. And so I think there's a sort of a, a bit of a cyclic pattern there, but um, all through that, people have always relied on analogy to use one system to predict how other systems might work. And that's why I particularly liked your lightning um, analogy. I mean, it might not yeah, be good. scientifically quite accurate, but it gives you a way of thinking about uh, things, yeah, that's right. what this is all about. It's, it's sort all of about visual, yeah. thinking about <clears throat> the systems. We don't, I mean, what you've put today is brilliant. It might not be exactly how the system works, but it's a good way to, to think about it and it will improve our ability to, to, to find new deposits. So well done, I really enjoyed that. Thanks. Um, did anyone else have anything? Uh, just a quick question, uh, Mark Gordon here, John, how is it? This was, yeah, I think driven discoveries in the last few years is, has been, yeah, the, our GS surveys and also has always been very supportive as well as GA. And the money that's been flowing into exploration and the winds is sort of self-fulfilling and just driving more exploration and more winds into the uh, game. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I, I think success breeds success, as you say, Mark. And, um, you, you know, I'm kind of hoping that we're just at the start of a phase of... Uh, or successful discovery, you know, maybe it's going to be like the sixties. Yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah. I'm yeah, working in a broker, yeah, working with a broker now and they're as happy as they've ever been, but uh, it just, there's just so much optimism around. Hmm. I've had another one come through on the chat. Um, fascinating to see the differences and similarities to oil and gas exploration philosophies and processes. Do you think there is any value in cross-pollination between minerals and oil and gas? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's there's a lot of value in, in, in cross-pollination. Un understanding that the physics are a little bit different in that, you know, when we're trying to make a mineral deposit, we're trying to flux the fluid through the system. And when we're making a petroleum deposit, we're actually trying to keep the fluid there. So. Uh, Larry Cathless used to talk about spitting basins and coughing basins, you know, between the ones that spitting basins formed ore deposits because they spat the fluid out and the coughing basins kept the fluid on their lungs and they were the ones that formed uh, petroleum deposits. But in particular, where I see the, the and you know, the, the, there's nothing profound about this, but where I see the most interesting area of intersection is in this area of base metal hosted sedimentary deposits because it would seem strange, but we actually have a poorer physical model for base metal sedimentary hosted deposits than we do for porphyry deposits or magmatic sulphide deposits, or I would argue even forogenic gold deposits, uh, in the sense that, you know, trying to understand exactly why and when in the history of basins these things form, you know, the actual physical process model, where are the reservoirs, how does that all come together? And you would, you would have to think that we could learn a lot from, from petroleum. And I know groups like BHP, who are fortunate enough to have both, uh, you know, copper exploration groups for in looking at sedimentary basins and oil exploration groups are very much trying to uh, exploit those synergies. 
does that question come from sort of MVT deposits and those sort of things? Yeah. And in fact, the other link between um, petroleum, which you just made me think about by mentioning MVTs, is remember what I said that to form an order deposit, you probably have to unmix a fluid or mix a fluid. Well, one of the best ways to make a sedimentary hosted deposit, a metal deposit, copper deposit or lead zinc, is probably to mix it with a petroleum reservoir. So, you know, I think they're often probably the passive receptacles for the ore bearing brines because it does the reduction and it's probably got the sulfur in it as well. I think I'm going to have to close it off, Jessica. I've got a few other things I need to do today. Being in the West, it's not the end of Friday yet for me. No, you've been so generous with your time. So thank you so much for coming on. And um, yeah, Pleasure. we really appreciate it. Okay. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. That was awesome. Thanks so much, John. Bye. Thank you.